town meeting television and another in our live candidate debate forums. It's all part of our continuing coverage of election 2020. I'm Matt Kelly. On this episode, I'm pleased to be welcoming candidates from Chittenden State, uh, Chittenden County State uh, Representatives for District 6-2 and 6-4. Both have won their primary contests and are uncontested in our general election. And I'm pleased to welcome to the debate screen, Emma Mulvaney-Stanek and Brian Chena. Candidates, welcome to you both. It's a pleasure to be sharing the debate screen with you. Thank you so much for your willingness to serve our great state and your continued service. Our format is a little bit more informal as each of you have won your uh, primaries and are uncontested in the general election. We have an opportunity to really have a wide ranging friendly discussion about some of the questions that we've presented to you ahead of time. And if you are watching our live stream, this is an opportunity for you to dial in and ask a question directly of the candidates. The number is 862-3966. So let's begin. Uh, Brian, uh, no opening statement, but perhaps maybe this is an opportunity to uh, share with Emma what she can expect as the newest state representative for Chittenden 6-2. Uh I'll be honest with you, Emma, I don't know what you should expect because you're coming into the House of Representatives under conditions that we have not seen in the history of Vermont or the United States. Mm -hmm. And not only are you coming in under these conditions of a pandemic uh, during which we are using technology to function in a way that we haven't before, but you're also coming in at a time of, of, of great recession, a time where our unsustainable economic system is collapsing and we are facing climate change on top of the pandemic. Um, so I don't know what to tell you to expect other than a lot of hardships, a lot of tough decisions. And I do expect um, knowing your politics for it to be an uphill battle. But I will say that we're excited that you're joining us. And I do think you, you're gonna bring a lot of energy and, and knowledge and skills to the state house. So, um, I wish you the best of luck as one, of, as one of the newest members of the Progressive Caucus. Wonderful. Emma, that's a wonderful uh, introduction from Brian to some of the challenges that you may be facing uh, going to the legislature from the first, for the first time. But I suspect your time on the Burlington City Council might have prepared you well, uh, but you know, technologically, et cetera, how are you uh, uh, prepared for the challenges uh, uh, to legislate in this current environment? Well, first, thanks for having me on, and um, and I I would agree. There was a, the moment I stepped onto the Burlington City Council, a little thing called Burlington Telecom was imploding the minute I walked into Contours Auditorium. And while it has, has absolutely um, a pandemic makes that pale in comparison, we were in crisis mode the minute I walked in and started legislating and on a local level. So. Uh, working under pressure, working under scrutiny of public um, public attention to an issue, going late into the night, and really trying to bring your best into a job that's very part time, um, while really listening and engaging community members is not unfamiliar territory for me. Um, I think the other piece around uh, the the times through which you're living in is to really have a frame of reference of um, uh, political courage to name what the opportunities are in this moment to really rethink the status quo to rethink how. Uh, the economy has not been working for people for decades and there's an opportunity to reimagine. We did that under dis distress, honestly, through the pandemic around extending unemployment benefits to folks who were not traditionally eligible, um, you know, spending rules around health care for people to have access. I hope that we can keep that spirit going forward because the recovery side of COVID um, is still uncharted waters. And I think it's going to take everyone's best thinking and um, best engagement, whether it's through technology and Zoom meetings um, or not to really um, bring the best thinking forward. And, and again, have that political courage to say, this, is this wasn't working even before COVID and let's have the political courage to rethink how Vermont can be a better, um, a better and stronger state for everyone here. So uh, Emma, we'll just stay with you here. You know, as you uh, begin this introduction uh, and prepare for your entry into the legislature, what do you see really is the primary uh, challenges that the state is facing? Well, I think on a, on a state government level, it really is around um, stabilizing the economy and stabilizing people's basic economic livelihoods. Um, there are a lot, you know, this pandemic is going to continue to um, 
churn and cause economic distress for lots of families. And those already in distress are gonna be even in a harder um, situation. So I think focusing on ways we can recover and stabilize are important. And that goes into how the plan for the next fiscal year for, for um, the state, it goes into, I think, really putting all options on the table. When, during my primary campaign, I looked a little bit into the solidarity tax um, concept that was used under Governor Snelling's term, which would be a temporary tax essentially to um, access um, more revenue by taxing the top wealthiest folks in Vermont to help stabilize so that the, the state, um, state budget doesn't have to um, borrow over the long term or we reduce services when people need them most. Um, there's just a lot of pieces we can put together to really rethink how, again, state government traditionally responds. And in that, in that regard, as I mentioned before about opportunity, I think it's an opportunity to challenge austerity measures we've used before where people assume we have to keep government contained. We have to shrink government in every budget. We have to have all these state services do more with less. Um, I think we have to really challenge that me mentality um, to say, well, we all do better when we are people are able to meet their basic needs in this state and to not um, uh, just go, go to budgets with cutting everything when people need those services most, like access to food, access to healthcare, access to childcare. Uh, the last thing I'll say is as a childcare um, user, my, I have a one-year-old and a five-year-old, uh, I am on the board of the local child care center and through COVID, it was amazing again about the thinking outside the box uh, and leadership that Vermont used um, to stabilize that industry, the child care industry, um, and to right. make sure folks were paid adequately throughout that whole pandemic to stabilize. So I think more of that thinking is going to be needed. Wonderful. A reminder, candidates, 90 seconds. Uh, but again, you know, we try not to interrupt uh, as long as you're uh, uh, giving a, a coherent thought here, here, here with I us. I hope that was coherent. Oh, it was great. Thank you. I <laughs> okay. appreciate that. And a reminder uh, to you, our uh, viewing audience, that if you do have a question of either candidate, the number is 862-3966. So Brian, we'll go to you here. Um, uh, Emma has raised some uh, interesting points in her response here. And so I'd be very curious if you would, you know, weigh in in terms of the state's response uh, to COVID-19. How do you think the state did and you know, going forward, what do you see as the biggest challenge for the state uh, in these unprecedented times? So when you look at um, pandemics in the past, the places that did the best in pandemics took the strictest measures in terms of shutting down their economies and protecting public health. And when places did so, they were criticized and they were called draconian and, 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 and over, overly restrictive. But those are the places that had the lowest deaths and the swiftest recovery. Um, and you look at the difference between Philadelphia and St. Louis, for example, during the pandemic of 1918. So when uh, the coronavirus was uh, coming up on us, there were some of us who called pretty early for the state to shut down and to, and to sort of position ourselves to be able to handle um, a, 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 um, a rush of cases by building the healthcare infrastructure. And um, the governor listened to the scientists and the legislature and we shut the state down quickly. And we are now looked at as a model in the United States of a place that's weathering the pandemic well. However, it is hurting our economy um, and we are going to have to come up with a way to rebound from that. Um, what this pandemic has shown is, is it's exposed the underlying problems of our economy. It's exposed the disparities and the unsustainability of our economy. And we have an opportunity now in the recovery from this pandemic to build a new economy that works for all people and that can withstand the challenges that are heading our way. And I'm happy to talk um, under another question about the details of what a new economy might look like, but I have about a second left, so I will stop there. So we'll, we'll kind of uh, continue with you here, Brian, and kind of continue continue on that tag. Um, the uh, legislature or the state finances are, are no doubt taking a serious hit uh, from the shutdown. Um, and that more than likely means that tough choices will be have to may, be made when it comes to the budget. Um, we typically operate under a balanced budget here in the state. Uh, do you think that that is uh, the wise course going forward. Uh, and I just want to add here one point, you know, we spoke with um, uh, State Treasurer uh, Beth Pierce, who said one of the reasons that the state did so well was the rainy day fund. So can you perhaps include that uh, in the context of your response uh, regarding creative financing to, to uh, regarding the budget? 
Yes. So the way that we do the budget in the state of Vermont is often uh, is that we look at the year before. We look at how to continue things from the year before. What are we adding? What are we taking away? And the budget is basically a statement of our values and the values that the legislature has uh, put forth while in my time there is that there's this status quo, which we are trying to maintain each year through the budget. And that's what we just did. And we were able to maintain the status quo because we built reserves in, which is wise financial management. And it is the policy of the state to balance the budget every year. And in general, that is something that I believe in. I think it's good to have a budget that we stick to so that we are not wasting the resources of our society. However, there is evidence from economists that during an economic recession, deficit spending can mitigate the impact and prevent a greater depression. And that by cutting government spending, during a recession, we are actually enhancing the impact of that recession. So deficit spend, spending must remain on the table during this, during this time of economic emergency as a way to make sure we don't fall into a deeper depression. However, deficit spending will not save us. And we need to think about the way we build our budget differently moving forward. Um, we need a people's budget built on the basic needs of our people and a new way of accountability and engagement with the public. Um, and we need to consider raising revenues by looking at a wide range of tax breaks for the wealthy and, and find ways to redistribute that wealth back to the people because those who did well under the status quo now need to pay their fair share when we're not doing well to make sure that everybody is taken care of. So very good. Thank you, Brian. Uh, same question to you, Emma. Um, and you had mentioned this in one of your responses earlier about uh, deficit spending uh, in the time of uh, economic crisis. Uh, that is uh, unprecedented here in the state of Vermont. Can you expound a little bit more on the budget and the hard choices that are gonna have to be made? I would imagine mm -hmm. some programs may have to get by with less and, and yet at the same time have to try to do more. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I agree with Brian. I think you'll find that we have kind of a similar orientation with this um, because I do think that we have to look at all the tools we have available to us in Vermont. Other states have different uh, uh, rules and laws that govern how they build their state budgets. And, but Vermont has a few more tools on the table, including deficit spending. Um, I think partnered with that is really making sure that we um, know clearly what the role of state government can be to help mitigate the, um, the negative impacts on individuals. Because when you think about it, if the state does nothing and when it just cuts all of the spending and reduces the size of the budget and, you know, and because it's just responding to the loss of revenue, individuals like you, me and Brian and everyone else listening might have to take on our own individual debt because there's less available to support me in my time of crisis. There's less unemployment benefits. There might be um, less ability for me to access whatever it might be, um, uh, food support, et cetera. And so to, to, that has a, a compounding negative um, impact on the local economy. For example, here in Burlington, I won't be able to go fix my car. I won't be able to buy take out from the local restaurant that's a locally owned restaurant who's also struggling. So I think that's why it's so wise to use economic tools we have like deficit spending or short-term lending, um, the borrowing that could happen out by the state um, with low interest rates that are available right now to leverage the, the, the collective nature of a state government versus pu putting it all on an individual because it will take a longer amount of time for me as an individual to recover by taking out my own personal debt or struggling to meet my basic needs than it would be if we collectively took that on together. So I think that's part of um, the solution and also really thinking about how do we not um, increase income inequality? Because as Bernie will say, um, it really, uh, it, we're living at, at the most extreme moment of income inequality and we should not contribute to it going and, in the future. <laughs> Emma, we'll uh, stay with you here and uh, continue on to kind of our next question. And it does have to do with education spending, which, you know, uh, contributes a lot to uh, the cost of living. Um, and yet we're faced with some unprecedented times in terms of remote learning. And yet this seems to probably be the 21st century tool. Uh, so, you know, is the hub and spoke model dead? Uh, is this the new normal? And, and what are your thoughts on spending to try to accommodate this new technology? That's 14 questions in one, so it'll be impossible <laughs> to get to all of that. And I will say that I am living through it personally, teaching a kindergartner remotely for two days a, a week, which is a humbling, humbling thing for people who are not trained to be educators of any age child. Um, and it is tough, and we are in a much more privileged situation than many of the other, our neighbors here in the neighborhood around access. We have Wi-Fi. We have you know parents who are, have flexible enough jobs to um, tag team, frankly, throughout the week to provide that support. 
and it is still hard. And that's kindergarten. I can't even imagine what families are um, navigating who don't have that flexibility and ability to support your child um, in, in remote learning. I think, you know, I trust, I trust science and I trust the numbers. If we can stay steady, that we're going to return to some more in time, in person um, instruction. And going back to my opportunity frame, there's an opportunity to rethink how we deliver education in the state um, and to really view education beyond the wall, the four walls of the school building and really develop better community partnerships. Um, the, the, um, the city and lake semester program that's run through BHS um, Burlington High School, I think really starts to break the ground about innovative ways we can take students out of the classrooms and to engage and not just in times of pandemic for the safety of having airflow and better connection with the you know, the, the community, but better connection with the land and better connection with um, place and, um, uh, and issues. I think it would do, do a lot towards equity as well. And I can come back to funding in a, in a minute, but I think just the framing of education and how we educate has an opportunity to be reimagined right now and to put community into schools much more. Uh, Brian, uh, the same question to you. Is this a, an opportunity to reimagine education, uh, this pandemic? It's, it, it clearly is. I mean, we, the, the reality is when we went into this, we heard people saying to us and, you know, people saying to us, you know, that when you have changes to society under a crisis, you don't ever go back because, and, and, and what comes out of that, you know, you, you, you learn lessons about the way, what was wrong with the way we did things about new ways to do things. And there's some things you will leave behind and things, some things that we, you will continue. One of the things I, I hope to leave behind are the masks because I'm already done with wearing my mask, but it's an important thing right now. So hopefully masks aren't part of our fashion moving forward forever, but like remote participation has revolutionized the way that we engage with each other. And as a psychotherapist, I am able to reach people in their homes using Using telemedicine in a way I never could before. And although I miss seeing people in person and I do go for walks with some people because there's an importance to that, remote therapy will allow people to access healthcare in a way that they couldn't before. And likewise, remote education, it may not be working for many kids, but there are some youth that I work with as a social worker who struggled with school attendance, who now mm -hmm. are ahead on all of their work because remote, they thrive in a remote setting. Mm -hmm. So I do think there's aspects of the adaptions we've made that we can we can take using um, use moving forward and use them to enhance the education system for sure. But there's definitely some deficits about the current situation, and there is a lot of um, harm to to young people, especially in the social emotional realm, from being separated from their peers during such a formative time of their life. And so, yes, there's opportunities moving forward, um, but I think we also need to do better with what we're what we're doing right now for people. Wonderful. Um, we'll kind of just stick on this a little bit um, because I know Emma wants to weigh in a little bit on, on the funding of it here too as well. And we'll just ask you to step in, uh, Brian, here again and just talk then, you know, in terms of education funding. Uh, again, you know, COVID-19 is going to present some challenges economically and, and we're faced with, uh, you know, a remote learning here. So uh, should there be more, more or less money spent uh, than we currently do? Do we need to change the formula that we fund it to make sure that maybe uh, digital tutors are available? I mean, how do you, you know, sort of envision the, the new paradigm of funding uh, this uh, new opportunity for education in our state and so, keeping it affordable at the same time for those who, uh, you know, mm -hmm. are struggling financially during this time. Yes. So the way that you frame that question, it kind of, um, it kind of mixes the local and the state a bit, because mm -hmm. I think the decision about how to spend the money on tutors, et cetera, should be done at the local level that individual, there should be more power for the school districts and actually more power for the teachers themselves to have to make be making decisions around how to best educate the youth. Mm -hmm. On the state level, we do need to look at the complicated system of education funding and the many formulas behind that system and the reliance of that system on our property tax system. It's a fusion of income and property. And I think some of us for years have been talking about, is there a way to look more income or wealth tax to fund the education system? Uh, I don't have the answer because it's an incredible, incredibly complicated system of financing, but I do believe we have a lot of work to do on the state level to clean up the system of education financing, to put to, to make it more affordable and to put more money into the hands of the local districts to make the right decisions to educate their communities um, and to give those youth the best possible opportunities to learn. 
Uh, Emma, I know you want to weigh in on the on the funding uh, paradigm here. So uh, Brian made an interesting point. I thought it was great. Just uh, more local control rather than state control. Well, I think local control is a, a double edged sword, and I don't disagree with what Brian just said, but I think the challenge in Vermont um, and this goes into a different realm around education. I just want to flag that sometimes local control also protects and puts status quo um, or protects the status quo in communities. Uh, for example, we don't have a standardized curriculum across the state um, that that really centers the full um, breadth of history that makes sure that women and people of color and indigenous folks are adequately represented. If you look in Vermont, because of local control, every district gets to decide how they they outline their curriculum and their standards. But there is no um, there's no uh, statewide you know conversation and leadership and guidance offered. But to um, to funding, uh, you know, I, I was a labor organizer for teachers and support staff for over a decade in the state, and I've been in very, pretty much every school district in the state multiple times. Um, and the co most common thing I would hear in every community is that um, schools uh, schools are an investment in our future. I mean, it might sound like a generic term, but I think really noting the fact that when we put more money into professional wages for the staff and give them the resources they need, there are better outcomes for students. Um, and, and COVID has shown nothing more than the, the fact that we have put even more onto these hardworking individuals in the state and they, they're being asked to do impossible things. I look at you know my child's kindergarten teacher and she's sending us emails at two o'clock in the morning because she has no time to communicate with us when she's prepping three days ahead to send you know home curriculum plans to parents and caregivers, you know again, five days ahead of when they need to be implemented and remembering all the moving parts. Um, and so I think in the time being, we need to infuse even more resources to support these hardworking, essential frontline workers. Um, I also would just echo what Brian was saying around examining our education funding system. It is complex, but it is overdue to be re-examined and have some political courage to say there are some with and with resources and those without. Um, the biggest piece of those formulas that has not been touched um, much even before Act 60, I believe, is the pure pupil spending formula. Um, you know, it hasn't been dusted off. It hasn't been updated to really bring an equity lens to what is needed um, for a student who has more challenges in a more rural area who needs more resources versus a student maybe in South Burlington or Charlotte or even here in Burlington who has, just has more opportunity to them. I think it's a time to be brave and bold in reimagining um, and really looking at all of our children as our common good um, and re-examining it. Um, one, one last thing is that, you know, for income-based uh, funding system, nearly two thirds of us in the state already pay on an income-based process towards education. And it, sometimes Vermonters don't, under, don't realize that it, it's, a, it's a variation or it's a gradation of how much you get as a, a rebate on your taxes, but we can go, I know you're gonna cut me off, but we can, we can do more in there and we can make the transition because we have done some of the work already. We're, we're running out of time. So we'll ask just one more question here before we get to kind of final closing statements from you both here. And this really is admittedly uh, something of personal interest here. And that has to do with uh, the role that nonprofits play in our state and the funding paradigms uh, that they're all uh, facing with COVID-19 and really the uh, imperative work that almost every one of them are, are performing, which often is a role that maybe the state or local governments uh, should take up. Can you just share with us your thoughts on funding some of these nonprofits in these uh, challenging times? Um, you know, town meeting television, you know, covers all the uh, local uh, access uh, uh, meetings and whatnot, uh, so that uh, citizens have access to their local government. Um, and that's just one example of a nonprofit here performing uh, a vital mm -hmm. role. Can you just talk about the funding challenges and how the state needs to really uh, put them and maybe businesses first, uh, because they're certainly made up of people, and that is an, an economic uh, challenge as well. Uh, just a final comment on, on the role of nonprofits and the challenges that they may face and what the state can do to try to help them. Sure. I'll go first, Brian, if that's a... Okay, um, sure. I can't tell from his expression. I'm going to go first. Uh, so, you know, nonprofits are a vital part of our communities and our economy. They're employers to um, thousands of Vermonters, and they're they're no no different from businesses, private businesses, um, and corporations uh, going through this pandemic. Um, so, I think what we can do is to not only uh, value them in our economy and our communities, is to make sure that they are thought of when we're thinking about 
how to support and stabilize um, during this pandemic. So what are their needs to, to make sure that if funding sources have dried up because foundations have shifted you know, priorities or there's less federal funding coming through um, for a whole host of reasons, how can we get creative? Um, you know, sometimes uh, nonprofits uh, work in silos in Vermont. And I think it's a time to, again, think innovatively around regional mutual support, frankly, between nonprofits to help support each other and to think around where there might be um, efficiencies and sharing of, of resources in a smart way going forward. Um, and I also think for the larger nonprofits, frankly, it's a chance to look at, again, income inequality and where there might be um, compensation rates that can be put brought more in line um, so that we're looking at highest compensation of um, the executive levels. There are large nonprofits in the state, for example, that pay a very, very well, a high wage to say the CEOs or the, um, the executive directors of organizations. And then you look at the frontline workers, for example, at Howard Center or these other kind of mental health in, um, uh, organizations in particular, if there's a huge gap, who is really suffering here and where can we narrow the gap so that everyone is moving forward and we're closing income inequality um, while making these organizations be able to thrive and survive. Wonderful, great answer. Thank you so much, Emma. Brian, same question to you. The role is of nonprofits in the state uh, and the challenges that they're facing, can you know they rely on the state legislature to really help them uh, over this uh, hopefully short-term short hurdle? Yes. Well. Uh I don't know if I can answer the question if they can rely on the legislature because I'm one out of 180 people and I often don't get what I want in the legislature. So what I can say is that I'm sympathetic to the struggle of nonprofits. I do work for a nonprofit part time. I'm a, a substitute crisis clinician for the Howard Center. And for years, we've been fighting within the legislature to fully fund our, our designated agencies of the mental health system because there's an increasing mandate for them to perform services, but not the investment of state money. And so this has been an ongoing issue for years. That's just one example of the many examples of how the state has underfunded the social sector and has underfunded nonprofits. I expect that you, when you look at the priorities of the legislature in the last year during the pandemic, the priorities seem to center around big businesses um, and not small businesses, not workers, not nonprofits. So if you asked me to look into my crystal ball, I would say that one of the areas you're going to see suggested cuts is going to be those areas. Now, I personally plan to fight to defend those areas, but the reality is, as long as we allow the status quo to continue, this, these problems will continue. And now is the time in the recovery from this pandemic to take a long, hard look at why it's a constant, why are we constantly accepting scraps in the social sector and in the nonprofits? Why are they not funded from the start properly? And maybe we need to look at the whole structure of our economy and make sure that these sectors are properly funded in the way that we structure the economy. Well, my thanks to both Brian Chena and to Emma Mulvaney Stanek. And it's time now for closing statements from each of them to sum up their candidacy and what they hope to accomplish in the next term of the legislature. And Brian, we'll begin with you. Thank you. So for far too long, we've invested the appropriations of our state in an extractive economy that's actually causing many of the problems that we're trying to solve. And we're caught in this endless cycle of spending money on systems that end up having a great financial, social, emotional, and even spiritual cost to people on our planet. And the coronavirus pandemic has only magnified the existing inequities of our economic system, of our extractive economy, which exploits the labor of people and the resources of the planet. When the economy was functioning under normal conditions, we were told it isn't the time to change we don't want to mess things up. And now that the economy is struggling under unprecedented conditions, we're told it isn't the time to change. So my question is, when will the time for change come? Because we cannot afford to wait any longer. So I'm hoping in the next session, we can, take, we can build a state budget that leads to collective liberation and a sustainable way of life and a new economy, a regenerative economy that truly takes care of everyone and our planet better. Very good. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Emma, your closing statement, please. Sure. Well, I'm running for office um, again as for a state rep because I am an organizer, an activist, and a mom. And as someone at this point in my life who started a small business um, and is really committed to the economic well being and the justice, frankly, for um, Vermonters um, who've been marginalized, I know that that voice is woefully underrepresented in the state house. And I think folks who have young families who are going through the struggles of meeting basic needs and finding adequate childcare and a job that pays at least a livable wage to support livelihoods in Vermont, 
that voice needs to be at the table um, because people who are directly impacted by these issues should be at the table helping to make the decisions and not be invited in occasionally to give testimony or ignored completely because they don't have time and they're seen as maybe being apathetic with the political system. It's not apathy, it's overwhelmed, it's being overwhelmed. It's, it's um, struggling around the economics and the income inequality in our state and in our country. So I look forward um, to bringing my lived experience to the building. Um, I know it's a wild time, but I know no different um, in many ways. And so I'm ready to bring some political currency, a, a, a political currency, political courage, and a sense of urgency on some of these issues to really think outside the box and to push really um, uh, rethinking around how we can transform Vermont so that we can be this stronger state that really brings economic dignity um, uh, and sustainability to um, our state and everyone who lives here. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. My thanks to both our candidates for their time here this evening and for their candidacy. It takes a lot to run to office and to actually legislate from Montpelier. They've done the hard work. Now it's up to you. All you have to do is vote. Remember to go to the polls on Tuesday, November 3rd, and that early voting has already begun here in our great state. You can go to your mailbox and complete your ballot and then return the ballot before the deadline. And then join us for all election night details beginning at 7 p.m. here on Town Meeting Television. I'm Matt Kelly, thank you for watching.